Yes. Again, uh, back to um, lesson 22A, uh, questions and answers, and finishing hopefully uh, um, book uh, one. Um, I think, uh, Blessing, you had a question, please go ahead. Yeah, my question is this, um, you know, in your last, in the last lesson, you were uh, explaining that St. John requires us to activate, to, to use, in order to grow, we need to activate the virtues of faith, hope, and love. Um, and, and I was just um, trying to reflect whether or not in the chapter 13 where St. John is asking us basically to deny ourselves so many things, um, you know, choose what, it, don't choose what is delectable, but choose what is less preferred. Um, um, was he, was those counsels or those instructions, were they um actually encouraging us to deny ourselves um those denials were they in order to, for us to activate those virtues and um, that's what i was asking okay thank you thank you very much uh blessing um yeah so you're trying to connect to, to see if there is a connection what is the connection between chapter 14, where we, we just had in uh, lesson 22, and the chapter 13, which was tw chap lesson 21 and, and 20. Uh, is there a connection between what he says here and what he says there, and, and how? Um, just to give you the short answer, yes. Um, the uh, the um, advice he gives cannot be realized, or it's and it's done, it's 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 um, the advice given for us to start to activate the um, um, theological uh, part in us. If you don't mind, just allow me to show the advice and then show the drawing and explain. Um, I, I, okay, I hope it's okay. So first and foremost, the text itself. Um, this is the text of chapter uh, 13, if you remember. Um, of course, we have uh, these main, the main advice, which is um, in order to realize this liberation, purification from the house of the sense, we need to have a habitual desire to imitate Christ in everything that he does, conforming himself to his life, conforming ourselves to his life, upon which life we must meditate. So remember, this is theological by definition, in the sense that it, in order to um, do this, I need faith, hope, and love. If I don't have faith, hope, and love, if I'm not activating them, there is no connection between me and Christ. So this is the upper part, if you want. Uh, what we just saw in the last uh, lesson 22, which is uh, we need to activate the act of faith and love in order to allow that move, uh, that freedom, that liberation. Uh, of course, it's God who realizes this liberation uh, def from the house of the sense, but he's waiting for us to activate the, um, the theological acts in order to allow himself to stop uh, the consolations, because otherwise we are not moving, so he's forced to give us the consolation, which is tragic. Some people think that when God gives a consolation that this is fine. St. John of the Cross says that asking for the consolation is a sin, is a, is a venial sin, and uh, that uh, if we don't activate the upper part, God will be then forced. Uh, he says that sometimes we insist toward God, say, please give me the consolation, give me this, give me that. And he ends up, in order not to lose us, in order for him not to lose us, like 
not to leave us in a place um, in spiritual life where we don't understand why he disappeared. So he sort of keeps an in-between situation where from time to time he keeps feeding us with consolations just in order not to lose us, but that's not the, sol the solution he wants. You understand? But this comes from ignorance because we don't know how he acts, what he's expecting us to do. So we, we stay there in, a, in between. And he, he gives the, the image of the child who insists toward his mother, he wants this, he wants that. Imagine very easily, you know, walking somewhere and the child wants a cookie or a chocolate or something. And he, he saw it in a shop and he's uh, like crying, crying, crying. He wants it, he wants it, he wants it. Well, at a certain point, the mom, in order to have some peace, just buys it and gives it to, to the child. But that's not what she wants because that's not good for the child, you see? So that's exactly what God uh, ends up doing. So asking for the consolation is a sin, according to St. John of the Cross, it's a venial sin. And uh, not knowing and therefore expecting constantly this presence of consolation or, or, or uh, insisting, 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 God ends up by just giving something. But we are not really growing. So the key in order to grow is to activate the uh, theological act. So I'm coming back here to the combination of the two, the two indications. And we need to uh, see how they both work together. One serves the other. So the first indication is that movement toward Christ himself. I cannot move toward Christ himself properly if it's not in faith, in hope, and in charity, in love. I'll be moving. As he said uh, last, in last lesson, I moved toward God, moved by the consolations. I need to be moved by a theological act, by faith. I cannot reach really Christ if I'm not activating the act of faith. Now, the obstacle in his mind is what? Is that I'm still enslaved to the house of sense. Enslaved by the five senses, the influence that comes from the five senses and the influence that comes from the two types of fashions. No, the ones that deters me and the one that attract me. Concu concupiscence and irascible, which is like it's, it's difficult to achieve, difficult to attain. Okay. So I am slave of, of that. So in order to come out of that situation, he is inviting us to use a lot of uh, um, determination. So an expression that comes from Teresa of Avila, but it, it follows here, the idea of St. John of the Cross. In order to point toward the theological activation, I shouldn't lean on the sensual perception of the grace of God, on what feeds the house of the sense. So what is easiest, what is most delectable, what gives me more pleasure, what is restful, consolation, greatest, loftiest, most precious, all these advices, not to go this one, but the, but the other one, the most difficult, is in fact not allowing the house of sense to be the, um, the, the cornerstone of my behavior or the, the, um, the fulcrum on which I lean in order to go toward Jesus. You know, you have the lever and the fulcrum. The fulcrum, uh, I hope I'm not wrong, is the, the, the point, the, 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 the part of the lever that leans on the solid area. And then I have the lever, I move it, then I can lift, lift the weight. So the fulcrum is that place on which I lean. He doesn't want us in order to go toward God to lean on what is easy, delectable, consolation, pleasure, etc. You see, but he wants us to go toward what seems to the house of sense is unpleasant, difficult, etc. But in fact, in fact, I could he could very easily instead of saying most difficult put instead of it, the act of faith. Instead of unpleasant, uh, uh, wearisome, the discon uh, disconsolate, uh, disconsolateness, sorry for my pronunciation, uh, etc. All this, he can put instead of it or behind it, because they are one. Anything that is not easy is difficult, and anything that theo is theological, at that stage of my life, is difficult. 
you see? So I am escaping from what feeds me from the, the green uh, area. Let me show you now the, <coughs> the, um, the drawing. Just give me a second, please, which is the drawing I was using uh, the previous one. Yeah. Now, anything that is giving from the easy, the easy bit will be what? Will be to stay in this house and expect that green uh, feeding here uh, on the side. You see what I'm trying to say? So he says, leave that in order to activate was, what, what is above here, you see? So if I choose the easiest way, uh, let us take an example. Let us take a simple example. I open the gospel and I'm meditating and praying on the today's text. I could read the texts in different ways. There is a group of ways that are easy and there is a group, a group, of, a group of ways that are difficult, okay? The group of ways that are difficult, more difficult, are challenging to the old man in me. The old man in me is the lower part. You remember the drawing here that I made uh, in two, two, two lessons back. The old man on me, the functioning of it is here. So if I lean on what I receive from the grace of God, that's the easy solution. So am I really meditating the word of God? Am I really facing Christ? Am I really listening to Christ? Or am I rather re listening to my own self? Which is easiest, most delectable, restful, gives consolation, etc. So in fact, what he's saying is what? When he gives me the advice to go to the most difficult, in fact, he's saying go to the theological one. It's the same. But it will feel for the lower part as being more difficult, uh, um, uh, most unpleasant, uh, gives the least, wearisome, uh, uh, most despised, et cetera, et cetera. All the series of advice he gives, you see? So one, one talks about the, the, the other and uh, it's, it's exactly the, the, the same thing, you see? So the best way to understand chapter 13 is to combine uh, what he teaches, like what you're saying, what he teaches about, yes, it's harder for the old man or for the house of sense. It's an effort to come out of myself to listen to Jesus, not to listen to myself, because I can read the word of God, but I'm listening to what, what pleases me, what I find in the text, what the old man in me, what the sensual part in me finds for itself. So it's consoling, it's cuddling, it's lovely. But is this Christ? You see, the word of God here, the, this example I'm taking helps us a lot to understand what is at stake in chapter 13 combined with chapter 14. Okay, so take this example. You're reading the, the scripture and now you decide, you say, okay, how can I apply the advice given in chapter 13? The chapter 13 says, look at Jesus, focus on him and try to imitate him, which is what? I'm reading the text and the text is talking about Jesus. Yes, but the danger is what? Is to read Jesus in two different ways. One with the old man or the central part in me and one with the theological way. You see, you understand what I'm trying to say? Huh? That's, that's, that's crucial, especially for a beginner. A beginner will, will describe it this way. That's easier, that's more difficult. But in fact, one is theological, one is true and one is wrong. Not systematically, it has to harm. Not systematically, it has to be painful. No, it's harming or painful to the old man, but it's not harming per se. It's on the contrary, it's giving me Jesus. It's giving me the supernatural grace of God. It gives me the intervention of the Holy Spirit, the true one, not the green one or here the pink one. No, it gives me God himself, which is the communication that occurs here uh, above. And this can be done, 
I would say very early. I don't need to wait in order to reach that because this is what God wants to achieve. Hence the variations I show from the beginning, they exist and they should diminish. Why the more I activate the upper part. Okay, so conclusion, conclusion. The main advice of chapter 13 is to focus on Jesus, listen to Jesus and do what he's saying to, to me and uh, um, imitate him. But this will be felt as difficult. Therefore, I need to be careful because I have two ways of listening to Jesus. As you can look here, as you can see in this drawing, you have a blue way of listening to Jesus and then you have the sort of uh, brown a clear brown way here to listen to Jesus. And he's saying, be careful, lean on the, 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 the other one, the blue one. He could have said just the theological acts are felt by the uh, sensual part as more arduous, less consoling, etc. Okay? So I don't know, have I, have I, have I um, sort of uh, yes, you shed some you light? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for your question, because you are um, you are even helping me because it it's I, I find it even now this chapter, I find it understood this way, of course, with the help of chapter 14, but understood this way be, becomes clearer and less scary. Um, yeah. Each thing is at its correct place. Mm -hmm. And it also encourages you because it's then um, means that it's not um, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem as hard as or as harsh as it first appears. So and it gives actually encouragement because the objective is to grow. Yeah. 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 No, it's not it's not automatically self-beating. Uh, it's no. not it's not uh, a masochist uh, spirituality. No, yeah. no, no, because that's that was the accusation, and it's still the accusation from from many people who who, mm. who do. That's this chapter is uh, has been the thorn in the thigh of 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 Saint John of the Cross uh, from for readers from from day one, uh, because it's like you close the you close the book. It's unbearable what he's saying, but it's this is why explaining it and and the journey we had together for twenty two odd. Um, uh, lessons is is uh, is very important otherwise um, it's it's dangerous imagine imagine you have a a, a person who is uh, who decides to to follow all this one you know the one percent who would really have enough courage and strength to to do that he or she will destroy himself mm -hmm. um, because you will dry yourself as the, the, the beautiful passage I, I read twice from Father Louis, no, it's, this, it's not the, the goal. But when we understand that this is all, a, it's hard for the old man in us and not for the new man in, in, in us, that's, as you said, it's liberating because you say, okay, I just need to activate the, and what it means, the, the act of faith, uh, the upper part, and what it means in fact is, is to come out of my comfort zone, the comfort zone of the old man in me, but the, the new man in me is accessible by the grace of God, I can activate it, and it's not that horrendous, uh, it's just different, and the more we grow, the easier it becomes, in a sense, because in the beginning, yeah, the old man wants his, uh, his own things, and he's, 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 he's complaining, etc., but then the more the new man in us is growing, the more Jesus is growing in us, the more his word is growing in us, uh, the less arduous it, it becomes. And we start, or I would almost say, we start to dwell rather on the upper part than the lower part. And then, then we reach what he's saying, what he's, he's describing, which is the house of the sense just stops being there. Like it doesn't have a word in the story anymore. Uh, now we move on to other issues. <laughs> Okay, so yes, thank you because this. Um, thank you, John. You're most welcome. Uh, any other question? No. Okay. So uh, shall we just read the, um, the the chapter fifteen and then uh, conclude, and I'll take the uh, direction toward the um, next uh, phase now, the next reading and studying uh, St. John of the Cross 
which which other book will be uh, will will we be um, addressing? So now let me sh just share the uh, uh, the text of uh, chapter fifteen. Read it uh, quickly, uh, one or two words, and then see what we will continue to do. Chapter 15, as you can see, is very, very short. It's the end of the um, uh, book uh, one, wherein are expounded uh, the remaining, sorry, give me a second here, yeah. Um, the remaining lines of the aforementioned stanza. Oh, happy chance or oh, um, blessed, luck if you want i went forth without being observed my house and re remember here we are only talking about the house of the sense being now at rest these lines take as a metaphor the miserable state of captivity give me why because it says um, a happy chance i escaped from the house of slavery a man's deliverance from which when none of the jailers hinder his uh, release, he considers a happy chance, like I'm lucky. I'm lucky now, I'm out. I'm out of prison, you see, out of prison. That's it, simple. For the soul on account of original sin is truly as it were a captive in this mortal body. Remember the drawing I made in the other uh, lesson, which is, um, this one, just give me a second. I just want to show the drawing because drawings do help. So remember the, this drawing here. Um, the, the soul here is initially captive, you see? So the human being paradoxically cannot access the inner areas of his own being. That's the misery of the human being. The, human life because of original sin because of all the consequences etc we are rather living in this area when uh, we look in ourselves or we look rather around us we can find that more very often people are dwelling in what comes from the senses what influence them uh, etc i'm talking general people not talking about committed christians uh, etc so we are rather um yeah living in, in 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 this area but slave to it we can't move we can't move so that's uh, here uh, i find the book of um, the interior castle very interesting because it shows that we can really move in ourselves it's like you are here but you can move you can go there you can go there and reach reach god himself that notion is very important we think that the human being doesn't move i am who i am no you are not who you are where are you? You are right now rather in the outer house, in the house of the sense. And you are not only there, but you are enslaved to the senses and the passions. So you are not a free person. Even though you are a Christian, even though you practice uh, different things, uh, you are still under the control of other powers, your senses and the passions. So you're not a free person, even though to a certain extent there is no mortal sin there, I'm still enslaved. I'm still enslaved. So you see the lower part now has the, has the final word, has the final say, and that's not a nice situation. So this is what uh, St. John of the Cross is uh, describing. So let us go back to the text. For the soul on account of original sin is truly, as it were, captive in this mortal body, subject to the passions and desires of nature. From bondage and subjects, subjection to which it considers its having gone forth without being observed as a happy chance. So when I come out of this and nobody noticed that I escaped because it's an, an internal operation, I have, I'm freed from, from that, it's a blessed luck. Having gone forth, that is without being impeded or engulfed by any of them. So the senses are not stopping me, 
or feeling me, uh, uh, they left me free. By what? By doing all what we just said. My answer to your question is what he is asking us to do. And by doing this repeatedly, the new man in us grows and then you reach a point where there is a shift. There is a, there is a move. For, for to this end, the soul profited by uh, going forth upon a dark night. That is the privation, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, privation of all pleasures and mortification and of all desires. You see, uh, privation of all pleasures, we understand now what it means exactly. And mortification of all desires, we understand what it means. I won't, we won't come back to the, all the explanations we gave before, unless you, you really find something obscure. After the manner whereof we have spoken, and by its house being now at rest, which is, which is here, no? The house of the sense now is at rest, which means it's calm and nothing is happening there. All what is happening now is in the upper part. It's meant the sensual part, which is the house of all the desires and is now at rest because they, they have all been overcome and lulled to sleep. That's the thing. Now we reached the realization, no? Um, for until the desires are lulled to sleep through the mortification of the uh, sensual nature, and until at last the sensual nature itself is at rest from them, so that they make not war upon the spirit, the soul goes not forth to true liberty and to fruition of union with its beloved. And you need to be careful here, because fruition of union with its beloved, it's a bit early to talk about that. Uh, Remember that it applies to the two levels, the first liberation and the second liberation from the house of the upper house, the house of the, of the spirit, okay? Now, let me just comment on one thing and then we will finish the, this chapter. Until at last the sensual part itself is at rest from them. So that make, no, you see the sensual part, this is a notion that he often uses, no? The sensual part makes war upon the spirit. The sensual part, if the sensual part is still under the influence of the senses and the passions, it's making war against the spirit. So it's as if that I have two beings inside of myself, and these two beings are um, uh, fighting against, against each other. Okay, so if I go back to this drawing here, Uh, as one I used to say in, in the courses, no, in the, in the School of Mary, I used to say the human being is like pregnant of two, of twins, no, but the twins are not at all the same. One is the old man in us and one is the new man in us. One is a, 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 a typical, a specific functioning, theological functioning, and the old, the old man in me is the sensual functioning in me. And they are fighting against each other. The, the St. Paul uses the, the, uh, the image of the fighting, you know, between the, the, one is fighting against the other. There are different uh, uh, references there. John of the Cross is not uh, giving them. So John of the Cross says that if the human being is here, is dwelling still here, uh, and uh, the, the, the senses are un, in slavery. So what is happening here? I'm not free to activate easily the, what is hap um, the, the upper part or, or the logic of the upper part is not free to, to, to be activated. This is why there is a fight. It's arduous. This is why, as uh, your, your, was your question, no, uh, blessing on, on chapter 13, I choose the most difficult. It's arduous no, to to choose the theological one because there is a fight. The lower part is dragging me uh, to below to, or outer the area to the senses and the creatures, etc. So there is a fight. This is why we call uh, the spiritual um, life, uh, there is an, a classic expression, which is a spiritual warfare, I'm fighting. But remember here, the fighting is very important. And I come back to one of your, your questions the, the other day. Uh, I'm not fighting against myself. Some people do it. No, they think that mortification is to fight against my body. I think it's better if 
I am fighting not to follow the old man by positively activating the uh, theological virtues. Some people will concentrate uh, their efforts on fighting what is happening below. And I think it's better to escape by activating the, um, um, the um, the theological virtues, you see. Um, I, I, I alluded the other day, not in lesson uh, 22, but I think it was lesson 21, alluded in a question and answer, if I remember well, to one of the passages to witnessed by, um, it's, it's this text, you don't find it easily. You find it in the old translation of Alison Pierce in three volumes uh, of the witness of uh, Eliseus of the Martyrs who says that St. John of the Cross uh, considers for the, that for the beginner, it's very difficult, it's very arduous to activate very easily the, uh, the act of faith. So uh, the person is too much immersed in the central part and doesn't bounce easily. So in the beginning, it's arduous, but then the more we activate the theological acts, the more we, uh, whenever we decide or we find that it's needed, we activate the act of faith, hope, and love in an easier way, okay? So there is a fight, it's normal, it's known, but it's important not to fight against something specific. Not the devil, not the flesh, not the world, but to draw, to, to run and throw ourselves in the arms of Jesus as St. Therese of the Child uh, Jesus says. No, St. Therese of the Child Jesus says, I don't answer the devil. And I would add here, I don't talk to anything that is flesh in me or anything that comes from the world's thoughts. I turned 180 degrees, as you can see. If, I, if you look down here, you are, you are uh, facing the, the creatures, but if you are facing God, you do 180 degrees and you face God. And she says, I, I, I leave the, the, the enemies there. I turn 180 degrees and I run and then throw myself into the arms of the Lord. But if she decides to fight back, if she decides that she never did that, but if she decides, if we decide, better said, to fight against the enemies that come from below here, then we are reinforcing it to a certain extent, we are reinforcing their presence and their temptation. So we need to be very careful in the warfare. Of course, this is not in the text, uh, but it's, it's in his mind when he's writing because he talks about it elsewhere, you see? So if we think that the best way to fight back is to face the enemy, no. Uh, you almost, as St. Therese of the Child Jesus says, you almost need to act like a coward. The coward leaves the enemy and escapes. She says, I act this way. I leave the enemy where he is. I don't deal with him. I just turn 180 degrees and I run toward Christ. What did she do? She activated the theological attitude in her. She moved in faith. This is why the advice is in the Bible. No, when you have temptation, etc., you resist in faith, with faith. You resist, don't surrender, but resist with faith. So seek what is the contents, what faith tells you. God is there, God loves you, um, God takes care of you. Just go toward him, go toward him. So you see how you fight back? You fight back by going toward God, not fighting against the enemy. That's an extra advice, but you can find it elsewhere in St. John of the Cross. I'm just summarizing the teaching, uh, his teaching and St. Therese of the Child Jesus teaching, okay? So let us go back to our text and finish the, this uh, chapter. Now, you see here, they make war, not war upon the spirit. He, he considers that the spirit, um, this war should stop at a certain point and it will stop. And that's the freedom that the person uh, feels, uh, uh, lives and experiences. Now, be careful. And I'm here concluding book one. Book one, as uh, St. John of the Cross presents it, is the effort made by the human being to enter in this night. But he says that the, the only effort uh, of the human being is not enough. We need the um, uh, action of the grace of God the, 
to free us also. So we have a combined effort. We need to do what we are supposed to do and God comes and helps us grow and then be freed, you see? Now, he describes God's reaction and please, I need all your attention here. He describes God's reaction. Whenever I, I put full power, full power into implementing what we now understand better about the advices of how to enter in the, the dark night of the sense, God will start to reply. And he calls this the entering in contemplation. It doesn't mean that we didn't have contemplation before, but it means that we are entering in a new stage of contemplation. And this is a jewel in the teaching of St. John of the Cross. And this is explained in book one of the Dark Knight. Now, let me just, uh, so we finished here the, the, the first book of uh, the Ascent of, of Mount Carmel. And now I would like to just explain to you what we are about uh, to do, uh, God willing, of course, with the help of God. Uh, in the uh, next uh, stage okay next which next book are we uh, studying uh, together now we have the purification of the sense and the purification of what St. John of the Cross calls the spirit. The spirit is part of our being, the upper part, if you want, okay? So the spirit and the sense. Now, how, how is he, uh, how did he organize everything? As we mentioned before, he says that there is an active part what the soul does, so this is the active part of the soul, and God's part, God's reply, he calls it passive, but I prefer to say God's reply. So what I did with the general help of the grace of God and what God does here, entering, changing uh, things. Now, this, all this is explained in Ascent of Mount Carmel, Ascent of Mount Carmel, book one, the active part, and the Ascent of Mount Carmel, book two and three, is how, uh, what are we supposed to do in order to enter uh, to to have our spirit uh, pu purified okay purification of our spirit now god's reply is in dark night book one and uh, the purification the the, the uh, god's reply for our spirit purification is in dark night too so in God's reply, we see what God realizes or wants to realize uh, in us. And this information is crucial for any spiritual life. If we don't know what God wants and can do in us in order to purify us and transform us in him, there is no use for, to have any spiritual life. This is why Everything is important because if I don't do what I'm supposed to do here in Ascent of Mount Carmel, I won't have God's reply. This is necessary. If you want, we are, there is a meeting point. It's a way, a way of course, to, to talk. Uh, there, there is a meeting point here. I need to reach that meeting point in order to have God's reply here and God's reply here. So if this is not achieved, if I stop here in the middle of the distance, God, sorry, if I stop at the mid, mid distance here, and then this is not there, God is waiting to intervene in my life, but he won't be able to do it. The beauty of the dark night 
is that it the, the book, the Dark Knight one and Dark Knight two, it's, it's one book, by the way, we divided it after in two books. The, the beauty of this book is that it shows us the action of God, God's reply, God, what God realizes, because we cannot do everything. We cannot realize that complete purification. We can do our part, but God needs to do his part. So the, the description of the Dark Knight 1 and 2 is gold because it teaches the entire church God's plan. People say, oh, uh, God has a plan for you. Well, what is the plan? <laughs> it's not to go here or to go there or to do this or to do that. That's total, utter nonsense. God's plan is uh, our transformation and union with him. That's the core of the plan. The rest is okay, you did this, you did that. Of course, we need to do God's will, but in a certain context, I understand that in the, in the state of, um, in a, um, in our state, you know, uh, like, uh, I don't know, a lay person, consecrated priest, uh, bishop, etc. We have to do our duties, no? Um, that, that's fine. But in the end of the day, even if you do all your duties and God is not transforming you, there is something important that is still to, to be done. And what's the point of doing all what you are supposed to do if you are, didn't allow God uh, to, you didn't do the extra bits of the spiritual life in order to allow God to, 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 to really enter, okay? So this is God. So my aim, my choice and my aim is to show God's reaction at this level where we are. Because if we jump immediately to Ascent of Mount Carmel, book two and three, we won't have God's reply. So we are still asking the human being to do certain things and we, are, we, don't, we don't have an idea of God's reply. So God's reply here is fundamental. Entering in the contemplation, sorry, Entering in uh, contemplation is described, especially from chapter seven onward. We need to know it, we need to appreciate it, and we need to desire it. And in order for it to happen, we need to activate all what the, the advices that we received in Ascent of Mount Carmel. Okay? Now, extra information for some people. Um, so that's that's it. Uh, we finished the uh, book one and we will be, God willing, moving to Dark Knight one. Now, for some people, you, I, I have a question. You, 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 you haven't asked it, but I, I, uh, I would like to ask it. Uh, some people will say, okay, throughout the centuries, we didn't have the teaching of St. John of the Cross the teaching that he's giving us in Ascent of Mount Carmel, book one. So let us just stay there, not, not move forward. So the question is, is it possible for a person who doesn't know, who never read St. John of the Cross, never heard of John of, John of the Cross, never had an explanation of book one, if, because you need it to be presented and explained properly, otherwise uh, you know, either too much or too, or, or, or too little. What happened to them? Or what will happen to them? Are there ways to compensate that? Now, I would like just to mention this is just a history of spiritual theology and, and to understand and place an author in the, in the general understanding. And I will close by that, I won't be long. Let us take the case of St. Therese of the Child Jesus. St. Therese of the Child Jesus never read these five books. Santa Mount Carmel 1, 2, 3, Dark Knight 1, 2, five books, she never read them. But instead of them, instead of them, she had the imitation of Christ, the imitation of Christ. Imitation of Christ is a classic uh, uh, book. Uh, was more known before, a little bit less now, but there are still plenty of people who read it and meditate it. She knew it by heart and she practiced it. Uh, as she understood it, she practiced it to the full. Now, 
She didn't have a center mount camel. She didn't have all the advice, but the imitation of Christ gave her the sense of the ascent of Mount Carmel, plus the quality of her response to this book. So this is an answer for the case of Saint Therese of the Child Jesus. She never had ascent of Mount Carmel. She never had chapter 13, but the imitation of Christ had the sense of the advice here given in ascent of Mount Carmel book one. She realized it and she realized it giving it full power. Trees of Avila, another case. Trees of Avila. She had imitation of Christ, but she didn't lean on it. And she didn't offer us a Saint of Mount Carmel, even though she knew, uh, she met and knew on, and, and lived for five years in the same city uh, of Avila uh, with St. John of the Cross, not in the same place, of course, but they just um, communicated and, and met uh, very often during five years, which is immense, immense when you think about it. But she didn't offer this. What did she offer? She offered the three virtues and not the theological virtues, even though they involved a full theological um, life. The, uh, that summarized the entire gospel, the virtue of humility. So Teresa of Avila, this is uh, St. Teresa of the child Jesus. Teresa of Avila, she had, instead of this chapter 13 or book one, she had, um, we find this in the book of um, uh, um, uh, Way of Perfection, she has the four evangelical virtues of uh, detachment um, and uh, humility and love, love, uh, loving each other in the, in the community. This is the, also a summary of the gospel, but she invites her daughters not just to practice the three, these three virtues in any way, but she wanted them to act to um, um, practice them, uh, indicating a certain perfection uh, in the uh, practice. And this is what changes everything. This is why I said Saint Teresa, Saint Teresa of the Child Jesus had it, but she practiced it perfectly, to the fullness. No, put full power. As St. John of the Cross said, no, put full power. Okay, so in these two cases, we had in one case, a summary of the gospel and the other case, we had the imitation of Christ. You can then study all different authors, all different saints, and especially of all uh, masters of spiritual life, masters of spiritual life. This is, these are the people we are searching for starting from the, um, the gospel, uh, the, the New Testament, uh, th going then through the uh, Desert Fathers. Uh, the first great masters of spiritual life are the Desert Fathers in Egypt and Palestine. Then we have uh, other, in continuation of the Desert Fathers, we have after that in the Byzantine time, and after that we have the Philokalia, which is a summary of all the uh, Greek Fathers teaching on um, a spiritual life, which goes along the line, the, along the line of the Desert Fathers. Then we have all different uh, spiritual masters, Saint Bonaventura, Saint Bernard, Saint Bonaventura, and uh, many others. Now, they certainly practiced instinctively uh, John of the Cross advice here, remember. The core of his advice is what here? is look at Christ and do whatever he wants you to do. So in a way, it's a type of Lectio Divina, what he's asking us. When you search in the life of the majority of the saints, you always find this type of, this period in their life where they put full power in putting, um, implementing and putting into practice the gospel. So in a way, I would like to summarize the entire um, uh, aim of St. John of the, the Cross in book one, in this paragraph three, of uh, chapter 13 of the book one, uh, which says, contemplate, look at Jesus and try to do what he, whatever he wants. In a way, it's listening to Jesus, looking at him, having uh, putting our gaze upon him, listening to him and doing what he asks us to do. It's in a way, it's the summary of the gospel, no? 
Uh, it's not the people who say, Lord, Lord, who enter in the kingdom of God and consider that the kingdom of God for us here as a first stage will be this entering in a contemplation, which is this liberation of the house of the saints. No? So it's not the people who say, Lord, Lord, who enter in the kingdom of uh, God, but it's rather people who listen to the word of God and put it into practice. In a way, in a way, you can say that a proper Lectio Divina, not any Lectio Divina, not just reading the book and then a sort of uh, entering in a sort of a silence and nothing happening, but the proper Lectio Divina um, does, does the same, uh, offers the same uh, result um, because it's the core of the advice of John of the Cross. It's the core of here imitation of Christ, the idea itself, it's summarized in the title, imitating Christ, no? And the uh, summary of the gospel in these three evangelical uh, uh, um, virtues, detachment, humility, and love, but because of Christ, always uh, we need to see how she presents this perfection. So here you are. We are still in the gospel, thank God. We haven't departed from the gospel, but it's a matter of putting full pressure and preferring Christ above everything else. So, any uh, question or we just uh, finish here? Please, if you want to talk, just uh, unmute your mic. I'm trying to unmute yours if you want. So we, we finished here the first book. I'm glad we went through this uh, beautiful adventure. Um, I offered sometimes two different interpretations. Uh, so please bear with me. Um, take both of them, I would say. Uh, don't say this one is better than that one, etc. Take both of them. In, in two different places, I offered two different uh, interpretations. So I uh, think it's, um, it enriches uh, the understanding. And uh, feel free to leave some comments also or questions. And um, let us now ask the grace of the Lord to start the new journey with book one of uh, Dark Knight. And especially starting, you will see it's a, it's a journey, but you will see um, after we cross the first eight, uh, first seven chapters, if I'm not wrong, uh, starting with the eighth chapter, we will enter in a, in a new phase uh, with the help of God. Okay. So let us say together, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Thank you, Lord, for this journey. Thank you for your graces. Thank you for all the prayers we received from different communities for this course. We asked the prayer of different uh, Carmelites, Benedictine and other uh, communities. Uh, so thank you. Uh, you all of them for their prayers because without their prayers this course cannot uh, happen cannot last cannot continue and also cannot bear any fruits so uh, thank you uh, wholeheartedly uh, for all the people who prayed for this course and uh, joined and thank you for all uh, the viewers um, and Goodbye for now. So next uh, lessons will be then uh, Dark Knight. Thank you.